Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone. I want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you for being patient during our technical test. Uh, my name is Megan DeBrote, for those of you who don't know me. And I want to thank everybody for being here for the final class in our summer lecture series, which has now taken us into fall. So I think today's class is going to be very exciting, very um, something different that most people don't have access to. So I'm very excited to introduce our presenter, my dear friend, Mikwa Steger. Mikwa is a member of the Schiller Institute, a leader out on our West Coast, one of our West Coast offices in the Bay Area of California. She leads our music program out there. And some of you may know her from her participation in the concerts with the Schiller Institute NYC chorus over the years, including singing in the soprano section, playing in the violin section of the orchestra. And then um, just under two years ago, many of you may remember her as our piano soloist for the performance of the Beethoven Choral Fantasia. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mihua Steger. Hello, uh, is everybody able to see me? I have a different view than everybody else does, I think. I have the gallery view so that I can see everyone. Um, good, okay. So. Thank you very much for having me here. I am very honored and happy to be with you today um, to share my thoughts, uh, also inspired by many, especially Beethoven. And as you know, the um, title of this presentation is Beethoven, Mankind is Destined to be Immortal. And given the circumstances that we find ourselves in today, uh, I, I'd like to make some initial remarks uh, and then dive into the composition itself, um, particularly Beethoven Piano Sonata Number 31, A-flat major, Opus 110. Um, in terms of what mankind is really facing at this point, we, we, we truly have a choice uh, before us. And I would like uh, for this to be a certain pledge uh, to end once and for all the system of empire, the system of oligarchy, the system, uh, really tyrannical kinds of systems that deem mankind to be a beast and not truly human, uh, not truly creative. So I think that the system of empire intends to diminish or extinguish the creative fire that we have, that we have uniquely endowed to us as a species. And we are here together to light it up and <laughs> um, get that fire burning uh, eternally. Um, so with that, I think um, to situate the context of this presentation, um, there is really uh, an important objective um, in the near future. And that would be the exoneration, full exoneration of Lyndon LaRouche. And the work that we're going to participate in at this point is certainly a continuation of our, of the Schiller Institute's weekends activities uh, on this very question that it is absolutely imperative, absolutely necessary, and absolutely possible um, at this very moment. Uh, so I would like to actualize that uh, within our lifetime so that we have the capability, like I said at the beginning, to end the system of empire and begin to build upon a human renaissance. And so, I mean, in terms of the exoneration of Lyndon LaRouche, it, it, it is seen throughout history, um, throughout the course of human history, when an individual decides to become a historic individual uh, and uses his or her talent uh, to revolutionize um, and also transform and transcend the human species. That is something Mr. LaRouche dedicated his life to. Uh, he was one of those individuals and he single-handedly seemed to be a great threat to the empire, happily. I think he took that upon himself as a true joy. <laughs> um, and in, in most part, particularly, he, came be, he became a threat particularly because he was able to demonstrate that universal principle is knowable, uh, that the transmission and the discovery of universal principle 
from person to person, um, from generation to generation, uh, from culture to culture is knowable. And that is how we gain our immortality. That's how we earn our immortality. And we're not doomed for extinction. We are destined to be immortal. And so this is certainly an honor of his work. Um, and so the, um, what I'd like to do, Megan, I think you have two slides for me from the Google slides. Um, what I'd like to do is go from the beginning, the first, yeah, exactly. So to, to really take us through what I just presented on the idea uh, that mankind is destined for greatness and immortality, uh, I'd like to share with you this quote from Mr. LaRouche's essay. Oh, hold on one second. Uh, entitled, The Four New Laws to Save the USA Now, Not an Option, an Immediate Necessity. Um, this was written in 2014, I believe, June, and this is the fourth of the four laws, uh, and it is the beginning, I guess, salvo or, or um, introduction to the, the body of the fourth law. Um, I almost consider it a preamble. <laughs> so here we go, uh, number four. Adopt a fusion driver crash program. The essential distinction of man from all lower forms of life, hence in practice, is that it presents the means for the perfection of the specifically affirmative aims and needs of human individual and social life. Therefore, the subject of man in the process of creation as an affirmative identification of an affirmative statement of an absolute state of nature is a permitted form of expression. Principles of nature are either only affirmation or they could not be affirmatively stated among civilized human minds. Give me one second here. That one comes later. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so hopefully allow this to sink in uh, because this question of the affirmative is, is integral to tr what it truly means to be human. And, and, and gives us an insight and pathway towards discovering uh, what this creative principle is. So I, I mean, I consider this the principle of affirmation, Lin's fourth law, um, in that he's implying, what he's stating there is that you can only come to know something from the standpoint of an affirmative, not from the standpoint of the absence of the affirmative. For instance, I mean, people see a lot of destruction around them. They could say there's a lot of war, there's a lot of famine, there's a lot of disease that's been going on for a majority uh, of the years that human civilization has, has existed on the earth. Uh, yet, that's not, that's a, that's a certain quantitative perspective. And what this implies, this principle of, of affirmation in Lin's fourth law, is the idea that we are, as I said before, not doomed to extinction. We are, we are destined for greatness. Um, and that the, the, the wars and, and, and stuff that you see, those types of activities are really just an absence of an affirmation of, of you discovering yourself what is good about mankind, what is good about human nature. And the systems of empire depend upon uh, detaching people from that sense of discovery, which is why, in terms of terrorist wars, they go after historic relics. They go after the, the ideas that built the civilization uh, to higher and higher modes um, of, of concentration, of power. And, and that's really the point, that mankind has the ability to increase our power in and over the universe. It's the universe is, is ours to discover. We were given that gift, and 
hopefully um, we intend to use it for the greater good. So uh, I think this, this system of empire that we're discussing, just uh, to continue to set the tone, is, is that predominantly knowledge is gained through sense perception. They don't, the system of empire negates the fact that the human mind exists. And it is actually discoveries that are made by the human mind and disseminated from, from generation after generation that is proof and demonstration that we have power in and over the universe. We gain dominion in and over the universe. And that is a power uh, that we uniquely hold. Um, so, uh, let me see, could you go to the second, um, second quote, please? Okay, let me see if I can read this from afar. <laughs> okay. So this was, uh, found in, I, this was a little treasure that I'd held. Um, kept since, I think this is 2003. It wasn't an American cadre school, it was an Ibero-American cadre school. Um, and Lynn gives a response here, uh, specifically around this question of how you come to know something is true, especially um, classical music, especially a classical piece of composition. And so there's two quotes here. They're a little bit broken up because he says other things in between. But for the continuity of the idea that's being presented, I wanted to put them somewhat together as one. Um, I Give me one second. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to pull this up on my phone because the... Uh, <laughs> uno momento. Um, let me just pull it up so I can read it to you. Okay. So he says here, the key thing is, I'm sorry, let me start over. The key thing is you have to take creativity and take it in all its aspects. You must have a sense of physical science in some way, which is how you can physically handle the universe you're dealing with. You then have to look at the kind of passion which you can get best expressed in classical performance of music, which is the quality of passion which drives scientific ideas on which proof depends. It's the passion in this case, the idea of beauty, passion for what is considered beauty in art and the carryover of the idea of having a beautiful approach to matters of social policy, science, and so forth. Passion. And thus, it's not just a question of having passion as separate from practicality, but it's passion which unites, which you feel inside yourself as beautiful and with what is good in society. So I think he makes clear um, his, his discovery, he, he did it for <laughs> decades, uh, and, and that is what I invite people uh, to become a part of, which is the campaign to fully exonerate um, Lyndon LaRouche, particularly because it's, it's the method of thinking that's of true value to the future generations, so that we are not, uh, we, we don't go down the path uh, toward more and more towards extinction and, and we move more and more towards a new paradigm and um, and, and a renaissance creating a, a true human renaissance it's been done before it may it may not have been the reigning uh, characteristic of, of human history and human civilization but it is what is the infinitesimal it's the qualitative nature of man um, so I think I'll uh, leave my initial remarks there and probably jump into the composition. 
since this is this is going to p hopefully substantiate uh, what we've just initiated um, in the discussion and I think M Megan has the the score you can put it up momentarily um, actually yeah you can put it up now which one the Beethoven opus 110 please and just so you know Megan uh, the pages the, the score that I have and the pages that you have are, are slightly different so I will make sure to um, try to follow <laughs> with you. So this is going to be an investigation uh, into the mind of Beethoven, uh, certainly uh, to know one mind, to know a great mind, is to, to have true, um, have experienced a true creative act. Um, so it's very interesting what Beethoven does here, um, and particularly what I'm going to go through is essentially the kind of building blocks um, that Beethoven uses in this particular piece. And once we get to the end, you hopefully will be provoked to understand that these building blocks are I mean, they're not elementary, they're just, they're fundamental. And the, the kind of development that Beethoven, a journey that Beethoven takes us through, is, is thoroughly composed. That from beginning to end, there is a purpose to everything that's uttered, and it comes from a germ of an idea, uh, or, what, or you could consider it a lunch of sorts. Um, so, And I'll probably have more to say as it comes to me. <laughs> um, so just to start with, uh, this is one of Beethoven's late compositions. It's certainly part of a triad, um, the Opus 109, 110, 111, that is composed quite late uh, in Beethoven's life. This one, particularly in 1821, and at this point, Beethoven is completely deaf. And so this certainly underscores the assumption of the imperial system that human beings uh, understand things through sense perception. It's clear, um, this is a demonstration that although Beethoven did not have the faculty of what you would think was necessary for a musician, a composer, an artist, um, did not have his faculty of hearing. So this is a real demonstration of true mind, and that this is coming all from his mind. Um, and he hears this in his mind. And that um, the, the nurturing of that potential, that creative potential, is what we intend to do uh, as a movement. And so this is, that's why this is quite an honor to be doing this. Um, so let me just jump in. So he begins, what I want you to do, what I would like you to do is here, just listen into the beginning. I will go back um, and throughout this investigation, if there's anything you want played back or heard again, please just pipe up. This is somewhat informal. Uh, this is loose, so we can, we can have some fun with this if you want to hear something again. But let me just begin with the opening. Uh, just to give you, to, to set the tone.
to stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very challenging to stop. Um, so what I want to focus on, it's, this, is, this is truly a work of beauty. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. And the, what you hear in the beginning, which is what I'll play for you again, um, progression because what you see and I think many of the people on this um, participating in this are in a chorus and the, the beginning is very much like a unified chorale where you have the soprano alto tenor bass all together and it sounds like a ever the whole chorus is starting just to lunch and, and to start it off um, so I'm gonna play the beginning few couple measures two plus measures not as written. You hear this rising uh, motive or motif. Bum, 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 bum. People hear that? Hopefully. If not, I can play it again. Now, this is this is this was a discovery by Beethoven um, that was a revolutionary discovery by Haydn, predecessor to him, predecessor to, to Mozart, uh, of this question of motifurum. And the fact the fact that the entire composition of this 110 is developed from really what you just heard in the beginning measure, two measures plus, um, two and a half measures, I would say. So what I need you to do is to keep that progression and that, that musical idea and phrase in your mind. Um, and we can always refer back to it. I will refer back to it so that we can just revisit home, in a sense. Um, as we go through the composition, as we go through the rest of the composition. And I want to spend, I'll tell you right now, I want to spend predominantly most of the time on the third movement. Uh, so if it seems like I'm going quickly through the first and potentially second, that's why. <laughs> and we can have more fun uh, another day, another time. We could, this could be to, to be continued. So let me just play that again so people hear. I'm going to play it the way Beethoven uh, composed it and then really uh, broken up, uh, not broken up, but how you would want to hear it. page, he just elaborates uh, essentially what he just stated as a chorale-like um, introduction. And after this beautiful I 
realized we tried to WD-40 some of the, the pedal, but um, I think she's a squeaker today. So, um, so that was essentially all an elaboration uh, and variation of what you heard right at the beginning. of ironies and ambiguities uh, and the resolution of those in the context of one thoroughly stated idea um, is, is really the point. And so Beethoven continues on this journey um, let me see what page are you on Megan? Yeah. Right. So I'm, based on what you are seeing, um, he has these, uh, I think I'd like to move to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to see your screen too. Okay, yeah. So that's, that's pretty much where we just left off, right? Um, Is it possible for Mike to turn down the volume when you play and then turn it back up when you're speaking? Is it, very distorted? Is it too? Is it very distorted? No, it's almost impossible. Um, if the music shouldn't be distorted, <laughs> so maybe I should turn down. Well, um, give me one second here. So maybe perhaps what I could do is turn down the volume for the music and then hopefully hopefully I can bring the microphone closer to me Can't hear you. Can't hear me? Can't hear you. Right. That's not going to work for me to be able to turn it down. I mean, okay. why? Just keep going. Just keep going. It's beautiful. Keep going. This volume is fine for me. All right. We're going to go back to the original. Okay, now yes, you back to the original. I need it closer. I brought it closer. Oh, yeah. well, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt. Oh, it's gonna hurt. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, where did I? Okay. We ended with Beethoven taking us through. I'll try to play. Not hearing you. Well, we're not hearing. What? We're not hearing. You're not hearing. Your voice is too soft now. It's very, very difficult to hear what you're saying. I think people were saying we could go back to the way it was and we'll just, the distortion is not a problem. It's fine. If you just turn up your speaker a little bit, you can probably hear her and it doesn't distort the music. Is that better? Can you yeah. hear me better now? Mm -hmm. yes. 
Maybe I could just ch shut shut the piano too. Oh yeah. I'll close the piano. Okay, so let's let's go back to where we just left off. Um, and okay, great. So if hope can you hear me now? Are you guys there? Yes. 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 Okay, that's good. Okay. Thank you. It's a go. All right. So here's where we left off beautifully here. just getting probably overexcited. Um, but just, uh, just referring back again to the beginning. It's this, you hear that. You hear these rising fourths, um, fourth intervals. And here, when he really develops this kind of extremity of the soprano voice uh, and the bass going in the opposite direction, uh, where he moves up to the fa, all the way up to the B flat and back down. So that's just to keep in mind, to revisit the, the motif of, of the germ of the idea of really how this develops and that it's absolutely um, interconnected. Um, so we're going to move forward. Um, let's choose a place here. Okay, Megan, I'm go back. So I'm going to go forward after that. Yes. Right. So we're going to continue to go forward a few measures, right where it says dolce. Between in the in the lower voices between the tenors and the basses, um, starting yes, starting uh, right in the third system, there. 
third system starts with the tenors, and then he, the tenor hands it off to the basses, and they have this brooding dialogue underneath um, the subject of what, that you hear. So it's driving. Um, so the irony is that you, you're hearing something familiar, yet it is qualitatively different. It's, trans, it's, it's in the process of transformation. And Beethoven is taking you somewhere, he, but he's taking you somewhere that's a, it's a, it's a lawful path, it's a lawful journey. So um, at the end there, what it, what we, where we ended was really home again. <laughs> transposes it by a half step or a whole step um, and and so con what your mind is experiencing what you are experiencing uh, as a receiver of this is is a lawful journey and that's meant to enrich you so that you have the, the you have the inspiration to go in society um, and and take up the challenges um, and fix them <laughs> and, and fight what you see to be evil um, or wrong. Um, so I'm going to leave, I think, the first movement at that. Um, let me just end it here. Go towards the end, Megan. Um, one, two, three, four. Um, where am I? Okay, <laughs> this is the challenge of having two different scores. Okay, so we'll just go from the, the very last scrolled page, Megan. Um, which page? The last page of the first movement. Okay. Where you want? Yeah, yeah. Because I want to make this. Um, I just want to bring it home again, or just show how Beethoven is a little a sly little sly person here. <laughs> he brings it at. He brings it back home. Implies what we heard at the beginning in a slightly different way. Um, so I'll just start again where these broken arpeggios are, uh, where you see lots of black. <laughs> Okay, um, and he makes it a point that he wants a very specifically articulated, uh, and this could be a whole other presentation. This is not necessarily on the question of performance. It's predominantly on the question of Beethoven's method. Uh, but just to give you a sense, um, he, he marks these dots above the A flats. And at the same time, he marks it leggermente, which is lightly, um, but he wants those tones pronounced. Um, and then I'll start there, right where he says leggermente, and then we'll go to the end.
end, let me just play, he sneaks in this motif, mo motif, I always, uh, this motif, uh, in the very end, the third to the last, third to the last measure, you see the middle voice, the alto voice, that starts on an E flat, uh, right, above, right above the crescendo. And then he ends. You hear this rising force? It's hard to hear in the context of the whole, but I'll try to pronounce it a little bit. movement. We could. Uh, it's, 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 it's clearly integral to what Beethoven does. I certainly do want to move right into the, the third movement. Um, but, yeah, let me just think through this. Well, no, okay. So we're going to go with the second movement. Um, because You've got to experience the whole, otherwise it's absolutely unjust. <laughs> uh, I would be committing a crime, essentially, so we don't want to do that. Um, so the beginning of this, he, he starts in uh, F minor. And I'll tell you something interesting about what you hear. two German folk songs. What I'd like to focus on is, uh, and Megan, you're probably going to want to pull up uh, the Es ist vollbracht, because there's an implication here that I found, which is very interesting, which is completely outside of the, um, the folk songs that are known about, uh, references about this movement. Let me know when you've got, oh, yeah. Okay. Now this is um, certainly an idea that Beethoven was absolutely inspired by um, and, 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 and really ch changed his soul uh, upon, upon hearing it, upon upon knowledge, uh, gaining knowledge of it. Uh, this is from Bach's St. John's Passion, um, the Es ist vollbracht. And there is a, certainly a dialogue that's occurring between Bach and Beethoven, which spans over a hundred years, on this very idea um, of what the Es ist vollbracht is, what the, the passion of St. John truly is. Um, and the aria solo from, from the St. John's Passion is what you see here. 
which is the conception that it is fulfilled. Es ist vollbracht. I had thought about it as it is accomplished, but I changed it to it is fulfilled because I think that means more. <laughs> um, but just to give you a sense, I mean, this is the translation of this aria is it is fulfilled. Oh, comfort for the ailing soul. The night of sorrow now measures out its last hour. The hero out of Judah conquers with might and concludes the battle. It is fulfilled. So this is um, really a question for all of us. Um, what, what, how we intend to spend our talent, uh, the one talent that we were given. And will we spend that talent towards the betterment of mankind, um, or would we waste it? And that, would, that, that wouldn't be any fun. <laughs> it wouldn't be any fun to waste your talent. So going back to this, why, the reason why I'm bringing this up, uh, which is not really substantially where it comes up in Opus 110, but it is a reference. And I want to bring up the Esses Fulbrach now so that we can also uh, refer to it in the third, the third movement. Um, so let me just play this beginning for you. then you can keep it on this, Megan, um, even if I refer back to the Estes Fulbracht, uh, because it's, it's really just a matter of hearing. So let me, I'm going to play the Beethoven, uh, Bach again, I'm sorry, this is the Bach. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, because I'm going to keep referring to it. You hear a sameness, I hope. Back to the Bach. That's how it's uttered in the Esses Fulbracht. Here, uh, in Beethoven's second movement, do the, uh, he doesn't rise up um, as in the, the Esses Fulbracht, how, it, how it's uttered. It's slightly different. It's just straight. But you could hear this. And so the implication is powerful. I know not for sure whether this is um, a reference but I do know for a fact that Beethoven did think about this initial idea of the Assist Fulbracht in many of his compositions, uh, and we will hear it later in the third movement. It's also referenced um, in, in uh, substantially quoted in opus six, his Opus 69, Piano and Cello Sonata. And you know, in Bach's compositions, they were all. You could also see it in several different places, including the chromatic fantasy and fugue, which I is 
a favorite of mine, which I know just perked David Shaven's ears. <laughs> so yes, I am working on that, and I did find um, Bach, the Assisvolbracht in there. So if, if there's anything anybody wants me to play again, please ask me to do so. Um, if not, I'm going to move on. So is it good for me to move on? I hope people heard that. Um, so then the, the, the trio of the second movement becomes a little raucous. <laughs> um, <laughs>
Ward. Uh, right in, let me show you, right there. The Adagio Ma Non Troppo. Where, right here, I'm going to play it again. <laughs> I'll play it, uh, it might be strange going back into the key, but it's, um, maybe I'll just keep it, and you can just trust me, <laughs> but I right hear... As you remember, so this entire section is really a, Beethoven picks up on this beautiful idea of, of, of rising above our mortal circumstances, of which we are all destined. We have a, a mortal end. However, that does not define us um, as individuals or as, an, as a species. So the power of this idea um, certainly resonated for over a hundred years, but, and we intend to propagate this even further and hope to inspire future composers to take up this particular method of motifurum and, and, and advancing it even further so that we can, we can make sure that the, the human species um, truly becomes immortal. So let me just continue. Um, because it does come back, this idea of the assist vollbracht comes back. I'm going to be right uh, towards, um, where are you? Okay. Sorry. Okay. So perhaps you can scroll down. I'll just start. Um, You scroll down. Oh no! You scroll up. Yeah. Before that. Oh. You can, okay. Great. Okay. That's pretty much where I'm gonna start. Uh, right smack in the middle there. On the A flat. Um, these inner thirds.
Um, what did people hear? revisiting home. You always have to revisit home, remind yourself of who you are, and go off. Be free. <laughs> and then come back. You've got to come back home at some point, uh, which is to, to creativity. We'll, we'll call creativity home. This is astonishingly beautiful. It's, it's very emotional for me <laughs> to be playing this because it's so powerful, and it's such a powerful idea. And, 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 and the value that is given to people to, I mean, this is really going back to what I said at the beginning, and you can keep it on the music. Um, the threat that Lyndon LaRouche represented was the knowability, the fact that human beings are, are, discover the knowability and truthfulness of these ideas by rediscovering them, by re-experiencing them. And it's not a textbook. It's not going to be given to you in some lecture, ironically enough. <laughs> it is, it's going to come through an experience. And, and, and if you, you can verify the validity of that experience, then you will have done the good. You will, you will be able to uh, manifest a real change in the universe and change the course of history as Beethoven did, as Lynn did. So let me just go back to this, um, the, the fugue, the beginning of the fugue, where we have these rising fourths. within the domain of your imagination. Dialogues, from the standpoint of polyphonic dialogues such as this, um, only occur in that domain of the imagination. And essentially, uh, what you get with the complexity of what's occurring uh, and the density of what's occurring is you get an increasing quality of drama that essentially what, what each composition, each thoroughly composed composition by Beethoven or Bach or Mozart or any of these um, tr true geniuses um, is the unfolding of an, an entire drama from beginning to end that does have a re resolution. It's initiated, it's developed, and you're brought on this amazing, succinct and powerful journey and, and you get a powerful idea uh, of what an idea is that is thoroughly composed. So um, let's just let's move forward because there is more exciting <laughs> stuff to cover. Um, let's see where I left off. Um, he he plays back and forth. Okay, so let's see. Let's go to the. Second page, right where the um, bass has the double fortissimo. Yeah. Okay, let's start there, where the bass line, bass line comes in with a powerful. I'm just gonna give you the measures before it, um, just to set the tone. <laughs>
and you can hear this bum, 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 bum throughout the whole thing. It's just interspersed throughout the entire. It goes from the bass voice um, and then it switches to the inner voices. It switches to the outer voices. It comes back and then um, there's more I could say, uh, but I'm going to have to let me see, move forward. There, like I said, there's a lot in here, especially with where I just ended, um, where, uh, let me see if you're at the same place I am. Yes. Okay, so if people just look at where the double octaves occur, is transposed, I believe, down, um, down a half step from what it was before. So it's just, it's going further and further down, which certainly, if, if you know where this ends up, uh, creates the impact. He, he's creating the dramatic context for the impact of the triumph at the very end, in, in the concluding passage. Um, so let me just play that shortly, just those few measures again, just from the, um, the uh, yeah, right where you have it. Towards the end, there. Do you have the? Let me just. Yeah. That's a good shot. 
Um, I'm going to start uh, the pickup to the second measure and the second to last system for you is where I'll start. Oops, I just lost. revolutionized yet again in the span of this composition. And just to remind you of the beginning. Um, this time he does this in G major. He begins this fugue, this dialogue in G major. But he inverts this rising fourth. which was which is also what we heard at the beginning so the concentration of what happens from this point towards the end is very similar to the end of any, really you can find any Bach fugue, which is a concentration of energy, of power, of passion, and concentration of these ideas, uh, where you, you, know, you consider these, these rising forths, um, and he compacts them, and I'll show you what, what I mean by that. So let me just play the introduction of the three voices again uh, with the third fugue here. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the second fugue. Starting now. just uh, 
pointed to. the double bar yeah so that that measure before the double bar the pickup to the double bar um, you hear this starting with the F sharp on the in the bass note you hear these rising fourths but it's no longer like these dotted uh, quarter note um, figures at the same time, if you look at the, I think it's the soprano voice at this point, right, yeah, um, the, the right at the pickup before the double bar, that G, and then the next tone she sings is the la, the long la, and then... Hopefully you're able to follow. I'm. I can bracket these out next time for people. I can. I can send out scores with certain things to look at um, at a later date. But at the same time, you have the concentration of the fourths um, right before the double bar. You also have an elongation. He's stretching out. Uh, so you have two completely seemingly contradictory fa time phase spaces acting together as a unified one uh, while you have a back and forth between the bass and the uh, alto <laughs> between those two voices so you have just this this concentration and that but then you have the repose of the long angel long arc of the angel singing above um, the voice oh sorry you can hear um, what this dynamic is. Again, starting in the pickup to the measure before the double bar line.
the when if you can go back to the meno allegro uh yeah right there so he takes a section um of the the of the uh idea that he develops concentration uh, and of course it gets he, he he brings you the whole time he's traversing all these different colors all these different modes um, to finally get you back home gloriously uh, which is what you heard before I so rudely interrupted it at, at, towards the end there so I'm gonna start again at the meno allegro and Um, what you see, yeah, okay, maybe you could scroll down a little bit, yeah, okay, so, uh, yeah, um, I'm going to start at the Meno Allegro, and then we'll go as far as I think. <laughs> first fugue. And, he, and this, this passage between the meno allegro and the tempo primo, if you're talking about concentration of density of change and energy and, and, and just a ball of fire, that's exactly what that is. <laughs> so let's try that again. Thank you. 
um, I can leave it at that. <laughs> and uh, if there's anything people want to go back over, I know this doesn't leave very much time for questions <laughs> and dialogue. Um, but uh, I hope that was as fun for you as it was for me. Bravo, <laughs> bravo, bravo. Thank you, Mikwa. So um, I know we're a little over our usual time. I'd like to go until yeah. 6.30, if that's OK with you, Mikwa, and our guests. If that's um, okay with the guests. Okay, so what, I, what we'd like to do, if you have a question, please use Zoom to raise your hand. You can find that button at the bottom of the participants window. Or if you'd like to type it in the chat and have me read it, that's perfectly fine. Um, so why don't we go to Belinda, who has her hand up for the first question. Just real quickly. Uh, where is the Tempo Primo? I couldn't see it on the score. Tempo Primo is, um, do you, are you working from the, the Henley Verlach edition? It's the second to the last page. The first time where, where the uh, double octaves are introduced back in A flat major. Am I unmuted? I'm yeah. Sorry. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to mute myself. Um, I'm, I was looking. I was following hers up there, and I couldn't see where it was. Is it more tempo primo in that score, Megan? Nope, but it's right. Oh here. no! Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You can see my mouse. It's right here and right in the middle, smack dab in the okay. middle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you see where I she's see that. circling? Yeah, that, right, that. right on that, in the middle of that measure, is the tempo primo. Okay. Primo tempo, tempo primo. <laughs> Did you have a question? Thank you. No, that was, oh. I was just trying to make sure I understood that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Betty, go ahead. Betty? Um, Betty has her hand raised. Okay, you can you hear me? Okay, yeah. did you say that this is an example of through composed, this sonata, or what yes. the other does? And this yes. is, I, okay. I wanted to understand that concept. Of yeah. Proposed. I think you mentioned it somewhere in here. I did. I did. Um, the through. Yes, you're. You're exactly right. Through composed, thoroughly composed, um, and it. It stems. It comes from that beginning idea motif. <laughs> Sonata is a development upon that germ of an idea. He built upon that. Yes. And, yeah. So Did you say it's thoroughly composed or through composed? Which is the I correct? I think we mean the same thing. thing. Okay. I, I, I think in, in other words, he built, he uses that initial theme, meme, musical meme, and he develops it and plays with it, inverts it, and does all kinds of things with it. Yeah, it creates ironies, ambiguities, he resolves mm -hmm. them. And, and all the while increasing the dramatic effect upon uh -huh. you so that the, the, the gift really is when you leave these from the beginning, the pregnant pause before and the pregnant pause after, is that the experience of that motivically thoroughly composed idea oh. allows you to comprehend something good. It affirms what is good about your mind uh, and, the, and the universe and the relationship between them. Yes, I love the way you brought all that in. And I, I really appreciated being part of this today. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back and listen to the other ones. This is the first one I listened to. Oh, wow. You mean well, the first Beethoven Sonata or? No, the first class of oh. yours or oh, whoever did the other ones. 
but it brings back my um, music classes or music theory <laughs> classes that I really enjoyed uh, back in the day. <laughs> oh, great. Great. Enjoy. Enjoy your music. Okay. Uh, Philip has a question, I believe. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, two things. One is not quite a question. It's, I, I was reminded by the uh, in the descending minor uh, uh, theme of a cello piece written by somebody whose name ends in Oni, and I can't, <laughs> I'm blocking on his name. He's later on, um, it's a very famous piece that would go, da, 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 da. Really? Maybe John knows. Anyway, uh, he picks up the same thing uh, later on. I don't know what the context is. It's a very powerful piece, though. Mm -hmm. That is exactly the same quote. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, about the relationship between that theme and the, the primary theme, um, major and minor, ascending and descending. But you pointed out in this case, Beethoven is choosing a specific reference, which has uh it's its own uh ideational overtones its own philosophical weight mm -hmm. would you speak to um what it is in how one shapes musical ideas in this kind of first of all as you said there was a, a problem stated at the beginning something unfinished stated at the beginning simply in those two and a half measures mm -hmm. Then it's counterposed to this, but if we didn't, if, if would a composer choose something without any references? Or would he choose just a single irony at the beginning without choosing a second theme to use against it? It's, it's, mm -hmm. if I, I'm getting at really the poetry in a sense of, of, of compositions. Some are more serious, some are, are lighter, of course, but maybe you could just speak to, to aspects of it. I think I hear between what you're saying, <laughs> between the words of what you're uttering, because it, it's, it's a little complex. Now, yeah, that's true. I did choose one, a motif that is fundamental to the actual composition itself and then the other which you referenced is a philosophical reference um was it necessary well you you would hope that the traversing this path for beethoven that essentially what they, they didn't write anything he didn't write anything or compose anything that was unnecessary it was only necessary to fulfill the totality of the idea that he had in his mind now, I, you know, it's, it's not a requirement in terms of poetry or composition. There's, I don't see there as, a, a, there being an, a, a requirement for, I'm, I guess I'm not really sure I understand your question. Um, I thought I, I thought I did, but it's escaping me now. <laughs> in a sense, I'm saying, what's, what's a musical idea? The first time somebody said, such and such is a musical idea, and I think he, he started with the first chords of the 111. Uh, da dum, da dum. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I said, okay. Well, I was completely mystified. I had no idea what the heck he was talking about. What's a musical idea? Well, how can you have an idea without words in music? So that, that's in a sense what the I mean. Ideas in music are experienced in the domain of the imagination. They ex they're experienced in mind. These are these are ditties of tone, <laughs> uh, but essentially they're heard with no tone. They're heard, you don't actually hear the tones. You hear the ironies and the ambiguities in between the tones that are the, the path that is traversed. So it's the mind that comprehends what a musical idea is. For me to play, you know, at the beginning, the, the sort of the, what was to become a full-fledged, thoroughly, like Betty said, talked about through co composition or thoroughly composed, a thoroughly composed composition that you can extract these 
beginning building blocks, motifs, just like the 111. And when that resonates in your mind, that's what I meant by home. You, you, you know you're within a certain domain of home. Each composition is a creation of a home. And it's, it's a, a fully developed, fully built, and fully composed home. And, and, and so the concentration of that experience is enriching. That's why the questions of physical science, classical culture, give people in society access to what it means to be a total and full human being, a full society, not just one or the other. I'm sure Einstein comes to mind. It's, he's a good case, Planck as well. Um, but there's many others, and there's, there's more that we need to inspire. People, you have people that aren't even born yet. The crime of, of not um, exonerating Lynn would be not uh, giving people access to the method of strategic thinking that is able to gain an insight into our historic predecessors, our history. You, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you rip people from their history, they have no sense of their, their placement in the world. So. Okay, there's a question in the chat from Susan B, who says, the opening of the sonata is so similar to Beethoven's aria for Leonora, <laughs> but in a different key. I never thought of looking at the fourths per se, but it seems that Beethoven then picks this up again in Florestan's aria. Could you comment on that, on the opening of the Leonora aria? No, <laughs> not off the top of my head. <laughs> but if, if somebody uh, wants to comment on that for, um, I'm sorry, did you say that was Susan B? Yeah. I, 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 I can really, at this point, vaguely think about what you're saying, but I can't qualifiedly um, expound on it. Maybe somebody else can. If you have Laura, Leonora's aria and Floristan's aria, well, I mean, it's something, I mean, I would love to look into it. I'll look into it and get back to you. <laughs> Great. Okay, Deborah. Hi, can you hear me? Hey. Hey. <laughs> so I just want a, co a comment and then a, a, a more a general question. Uh, but my sure. comment is, you know, when you, when you, um, uh, had the comments from Lynn from the Ibero-American Cadre School, mm -hmm. where the question was, how do you know if an idea is true? Uh, and mm -hmm. Lynn actually you know, discussed the question of passion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that is a, in, your internal in, intention. And, um, and, you know, to have that express this is so beautifully expressed in music with no words about whether something's true or not true or is it right or not or you know whatever but with, in, with no words in music it's a perfect expression of how do you know an idea is true you know it really this, this, you, I, anyway i wanted to have you comment on that and then i have a more general question actually let me comment on that because this goes back to what megan was saying last week in her presentation um with kepler and aristotle and aristotle ultimately saying that we are a tabula rasa we are an empty tablet empty soul nothing whiteboard and uh i guess your life is experiential and and what you're bringing up in this question of the principle of affirmation that Lynn brings up in his fourth law is that you're rediscovering already what what is in your soul what is within your soul it's a process of rediscovery and you have to that's what makes life exciting you're taken on a journey you decide to 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 roll your sleeves up and solve some problems confront some challenges and and you discover more and more about yourself Okay, good. Thanks. Um, I, w I just wanted to ask a general question, which I was, I've was i thought about uh, only generally in, in listening. I've been listening more to Beethoven's piano sonatas and oh. also 
violin and piano mm -hmm. sonatas. And um, the question of um, repeating uh, uh, an opening idea mm -hmm. and then re re repeating re or and, and having uh, almost an interlude and then repeating it and then taking that idea and creating a change in it to the end. And, um, you know, because I, I don't have a real concrete idea, but I know in this time, uh, I found myself um, able to see what I missed on the first go around <laughs> in terms right. of the fourth yeah. and, and the uh, and, and, and the dialogue, you know, between the voices in it. And so I thought I'd want to ask you to say something about that. That's a very, very good question um, because it, it reminds me of the nature of why, and this also goes to what Philip brought up on the question of poetry and the word, because poetry or classical music certainly supersedes mathematics. And you have the nature of, I mean, why uh, the beginning in terms of the sonata form the, I mean, this is, it happens everywhere, that the beginning is, is repeated, um, that it's necessary to an extent to the human mind. I mean, if you listen to it without the repeat, it just doesn't make any sense. And I know this is, this is certainly not an answer to what that is, but uh, the fact that you've experienced the, the, sort of necessity of uttering it yet again. Um, I mean, that, that sort of explains it somewhat in and of itself. But I don't, yeah. I'm gonna think about it, because <laughs> it's a really good question. <laughs> Emma, do you have a question? Emma. Yeah, hey, Miigwa. Hey. Thanks for this. Um, my, Thank you. I, I don't know if I totally have it in my mind exactly what my question is, but I think that I hear the Wretched to Tea from the Ninth Symphony in hmm. there, in the second movement, maybe? You mean the Wretched to Tea from the bass? Yeah. Um, not the second movement. Not the second movement, maybe it's in the <laughs> third movement. No, no, it's like way in the middle of it or something. Um, but if it is in there, I guess my question is, what is what is the significance for Beethoven of utilizing that? Because I don't think that's the only time that he uses it is in this sonata. But you know, it obviously has very important implications in the Ninth Symphony. Um, so I wonder if he's making a similar statement with it, like, you know, not these tones, but let's move forward type Make of a thing. these a ton of turn yeah. on. Wow. Cause see, like I'm, <laughs> now I'm thinking about, wait, hold on. This. Yeah, I wish I had the score. I could, I could help. I, I don't think it's in the second movement. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's in the third movement. It's in the it third. It is in the third movement. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that. Oh, Freunde, nicht diese Töne. Right? Yeah, and it sort of is um, kind of extended for a little while. Obviously changed, yeah. but. Yeah, anyway, well, he uses this also um, thematically. You can find it in the. Um, is it the, the uh, I know he uses no, it. No, no, it's another Beethoven. The Tempest. The Tempest. Hmm. Uh, yeah, he uses the same, similar idea. But yeah, you're right. It's in the. But I wonder if it has a similar application in this sonata. Well, I think they're so intertwined as uh, and so inter in, in, interconnected in terms of his own soul, his own mind, that there, 
they're organic. They naturally come up. And yeah. this, there's a certain quality of um, improvisation that's there, but it's not really because he has developed that idea substantially like you're bringing up in the Ninth Symphony, uh, which is after this one or before? It's sort of during around the same period, but certainly not during the Tempest. The Tempest was long, long before this. So yeah, that was a good, good observation. The other thing, maybe if, if there's not somebody already waiting, um, looks like there is, but maybe you can address this because uh, everybody wants to assert, especially young people were coming across in the music world that, well, one, that music has no meaning, <laughs> but then two, that like classical music is just basically mathematical music. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I mean, I've never taken a music class in my life, really. I took like one music theory class in high school. Um, right. So I don't exactly know where they're getting that idea or how they're applying it's, that idea. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's pervasive in the culture. Yeah. It, it is the culture of, you, you can only know something through sense perception which is this, the, it, it, it's the reigning dynamic of the culture, which is why the principle of affirmation, that people have to be taken through a process of discovery to affirm to them what, is, what already exists within them. They have a metric. People, when, when they hear a musical idea as, you know, a, take aside, take them out of the general popular culture um, I mean, that's why you can play Beethoven and Bach in Africa and the United States and Europe and in prisons and all other different places. And it has a universal effect because our people are experiencing something that is true. Those comments come from people that haven't had the, the privilege. They, it's been essentially taken from them because they live in a culture that says, well, opinions are the only thing that you know to be true, and and and, and everything's based on, um, you know, a deduction of, of sense perception, and that's why that's that's what empires really do thrive off of. They thrive off of people that don't go through the scientific, physical, scientific process of of the sciences as well as the culture, I and mean, that's why Lynn laid out the specific approach to a method of learning the the narrow path that we that we traversed and we've we've got to do that again we've got to cr build academies based on this method because there's no other way that person won't transform as an individual until i mean it's like it's it, the simplest example is when you when you experience the doubling of the cube that's that experience is irreversible like you can you can reject <laughs> you, you can reject what that means <laughs> and go about your daily life but if you're an honest person and a person that lives for shaping history then that effect is irreversible and and then you become hungrier and hungrier for that kind of idea that kind of impact and that kind of discovery and that's that's what impels people to become, you know, better, to become geniuses. Because they want that experience. Okay, Peter is going to ask our final question. I might get a text with a comment that I'll tag <laughs> on to Peter's question. And so meanwhile, what I'd like you to do is, in your answer to Peter's question, also if you have any concluding uh, comments or remarks to, to make sure. as well. Thanks. Okay, can you hear me? Pete Bowen, Pete and Marsha. Good to see you guys. <laughs> Good to see you. <clears throat> I just had a comment. I mean, what that Emma sort of made me think about a little bit is that, you know, I mean, obviously, Beethoven knows that these themes, uh, where they're coming from. I mean, he, he knows the aria from Floristan or, or you know, Leonora, right? He knows sure. Bach. Sure. And it seems to me that part of what's going on here is 
He's playing. He's just having fun. He's saying, okay, here's an idea. I'm going to turn it into this. And then I'm going to turn it into that. But, in the, but I'm going to create a totality which is completely coherent. Mm -hmm. and, but he's having fun doing it. Saying, okay, remember this one? Well, see how I got here? You know, that kind of thing. Exactly. That's, 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 Lyndon, that's Lyndon LaRouche's sense of fun. <laughs> right there. <laughs> that's demonstrated. So I, I, I think this um, hopefully will, will speak for itself. I've had a wonderful time with everybody here. And uh, lots to think about from the questions from, from everybody and the thoughts from everybody. And I hope to stay in contact. Um, with everybody, uh, and hope to be in this in this in this situation again, <laughs> where we can continue the dialogue. But um, no, I think we we are on the precipice of of what could be a total transformation for the human species if we were to choose to do the good, uh, because that evil evil exists, but it, it's really because the good decide to say, well, somebody else can do it. But if we decide to become the bearers uh, of, of the joy. We don't want everybody else to have fun, and we certainly don't want the leaders of the empire to have their fun. <laughs> so <laughs> we got to beat them out. <laughs> so that's, um, that's what I'd say, to be continued. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we should definitely have a part two and part three. <laughs> at some point Thanks in the not too distant future. So thank you to Mihua. Thank you to everybody who got on. October 11th, two weeks from today, I think, um, at the same at 4:30 Eastern is our next Musik Abend with performances from members of the chorus, guests, and friends, and also the premiere of uh, the New York, or the Schiller Institute Chorus's first performance of the Kyrie movement of Beethoven's Misa Salamna. Oh, so I just want to make sure everybody knows about that, and um, you can find out more on the Schiller Chorus website. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to me. Thank you. And we'll Bye, everyone. Talk to you soon. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Betty. Bye, everyone. The whole piece.